Now, let's say for instance, we have a surface down here. Now let's make a copy of our surface. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a copy, I'm gonna use vertical. I'm gonna bring it up to here. So now I have another surface. I'm just gonna scale this guy a little bit. What I'd like to see if whether I could do, or what I'd like to see if I can do is, is I'd like to actually, instead of controlling, let's say for instance, the height of these objects using something like a slider, what if we could create boxes that are actually between surfaces? So let's go ahead and save this, this file. It's our surface boxes working. And take a look at the next um, file. So in the surface box, again, you can see that that surface, as it changes, that component is going to deform. And in the next um, exercise, we'll use something called a blend box. And what this will do is actually create a box that will be between two surfaces, allowing us to be able to deform the component between surfaces. Now, we know that the morphing tab is where we find the different objects that allow us to work with this technique. And the one that we're looking for now is this guy called Blendbox. So Blendbox creates a twisted box between two surfaces. And if I drop that down and I just compare it to the guy that we have right here, you can see that it's very similar. It has an S and a D. This time it's called surface A, domain A. And then it has S, B, D, B. So this is surface B and domain B. B. So I'm just going to delete this, and if you notice there's no height control because the height's going to actually be derived from the distance between the two surfaces. Since we already set up our file, I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bit more specific. I'm going to call this domain A, and I'm going to call this target surface A. I'll go ahead and take these two in and then replicate this for my other surface. So we know that we're using the space of the surface to be able to transform the component. So if we're going to use more than one surface, we need to ensure that we have the same number of subdivisions in each. So when I take and make a copy, I will be copying only these two so that my slider will stay con connected to both the top and the bottom, ensuring that we have the right number of divisions for both. I'm going to change the name of this container to B, and I'm going to clear by right-clicking what was inside here. I'm going to reset what was inside of there using this surface. And I'm going to rename this to domain B. So I'll give you guys a second to, um, to get that done. And then go ahead and hook this up correctly. So there's a question uh, that is asking, is there a flow along surface in Grasshopper? Um, actually, um, the map to surface component um, file that we looked at first, that is exactly what flow along surface is. So if you wanted to, um, instead of having multiple units flow along the surface, if you just wanted to deform one object through the surface, you would just set your sliders to one and one for U and B. So that, that's exactly what flow along surface is. Um, if, you had, if, if you'd like me to expand on that a little bit, just please post another question. We can elaborate a little bit. So I'm going to take my target surface B into B. My domain B into domain B, and we can see here that we now have boxes that are blending between the two surfaces. Now, if I uh, 
change the height of this a little bit, move it down a little, we can see that this is adapting. And if we take this into T, we'll see that we now have our components blending between the two surfaces. So there's a question um, that asks, can you set the domain for the flow numbers along U and V so that the end boxes are not there? Um, if you'd like to do that, the easiest way would be to actually just call um, the last row uh, and the first row and the last column and the first column, isolating the interior boxes um, that you're, you're wanting to um, actually flow to. Um, there was a question that was, do you need to unfold the surface or just use the same domain? If you're using a poly surface, you always need to isolate the faces um, and apply this to each one of the faces separately. Because the surfaces, um, the poly surface, um, the surfaces that make up the poly surfaces, share edges, they also share topology. So the um, U and the V um, will be something that can change for each one depending upon uh, which orientation U and V is in. So let's say, for instance, over here, U is in this direction. U is in this direction, if you notice the red line and the green lines. V is in this direction. So U would need to be the same if we wanted to ensure that the components on this side and this side seemed. But V could change for this one and this one because it doesn't, there's no, no, no need to seam um, from this edge over. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? All right, so this is really going to be our target boxes then. And then this would be our morphed components. So if you notice, the, um, the workflow is really very similar in each one of those techniques that we looked at when we're talking about morphing. Because the, the concept behind it, or the kind of principle issues that you need to address um, are consistent. You have a component, something that you've designed, and you have a substrate or somewhere that you would like for it to transform through. You need to have a reference, so here a reference, and you need to have a target because the component needs to have a space through which to interpolate. So it looks initially to its own bounding box and compares that bounding box to the target box to understand how to transform the object, which is all facilitated here. Again, if you group, the last step would be to ungroup. Ungrouped components. All right. And again, you know, you can see that what it allows you to do is really to, in this case, focus on designing um, an object, seeing how it transforms, seeing if that is interesting to you, having a very quick and easy way to facilitate its deformation, its change. And then from there, I would, I would actually argue that it would be worth the time to invest in a fully parametric explicit system because you'd already have a sense of what the desired effect is, whether or not the component seems to transform um, in an interesting way, et cetera. And it gives you a lot better, um, I think a more uh, thorough or, or, or a better starting point to then uh, begin to develop the um, more explicit um, kind of uh, parametric file. Um, 
Ah, great. We had uh, uh, one last question that came in that was um, asking the question of how to thicken. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and swap out my component really quick. Uh, I'm just going to set it here. And this is one thing that I really love is that um, I'll just bring that guy over here. So this is the, the kind of mock-up using this component. And if I just right-click here and just say set one geometry, the whole thing updates, right? It's just really that quick. Um, if I turn up the dial, since I'm using meshes, you can see that I can get a very high fidelity. Because I'm using meshes, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn on some control points here so we can see the transformation a little bit clearer. There we go. Uh, I also have a whole suite of tools that I can use uh, to be able to um, thicken these guys and prepare them for 3D printing. Now, um, because we, you know, this, this webinar isn't really focusing on um, the use of the subdivision modeling techniques, I'm not going to go too uh, far into that, but I do want to show you how um, you can begin to um, to prepare this for 3D printing, for instance, since we are using meshes. Now, one thing you'll notice is that if we go to the Mesh Utility tab, now be aware that um, I have added things to my Mesh tab, um, and uh, you might not have all these these objects in your in your uh, Grasshopper. Um, but if you're interested in, in doing this uh, on your own. Um, there is uh, this modeling for subdivision, uh, subdivision modeling with Weaverbird uh, webinar that we um, uh, recently held um, that would be able to go into all of this um, for you. Um, so there isn't actually an object here um, called Thicken um, or anything like that, meshes. Um, but the tool that I mentioned, Weaverbird, um, does have an object um, here called Thicken, and I'll just show you how this plays out really quickly. Um, you have an object, which is to thicken, thicken my components, right? Um, I have a little slider that I can set for, you know, how much to thicken it. Because I have ungrouped these, I have, if you notice here, a bunch of meshes. So um, I'm just going to join them, join. I'm going to flatten this input here so that they just become one mesh. Meshes, um, when you join them, they'll still have coincident vertices. Um, so to be able to remedy that situation, I'll use this component called weld. This will actually um, make all the vertices on, that are on top of each other um, be joined into one. Out of here is my mesh. Into here, it's now thickened. You notice here I have thickness. And from Weaver Bird again, I'll just use my smoothing object. And uh, I'll go ahead and just tell this to smooth a lot. I bake that. See, it's a watertight mesh um, ready for 3D printing. Now again, um, you know, that last step is really a little bit outside of the purview of, uh, of this particular webinar um, because these tools from here on over um, are really uh, something that you have to um, install ahead of time to be able to do that. But um, it was a nice question because that's really a segue, I think, um, into the talking point about where to go from here. Now, 